Um, so thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I anticipated that this room would probably be the least full, given that law is probably the most dry subject. So I'm going to try and try and make it interesting. But you know, my preference would be for me to run through the presentation, and certainly if, if I'm going too quickly or if I'm being too simplistic, or if you've got any questions, then you know, please jump in. The, the more interactive and um, discussive this session is, I think, the better, because I think that's how we'll I certainly need to learn more about the kind of things, the, the kind of challenges you face in digital. Okay. So here's what I, I want to talk to you about today. Uh, give you, in fact, I should probably give you a bit of background on um, Reed Smith. We, uh, formerly known as Richards Butler, we now a law firm with 1,700 lawyers. If you can imagine that, it's quite scary. Um, and we have a very strong media practice globally. Um, and a rated top tier in the UK. So we deal with a lot of film financiers, film producers, distributors, and increasingly more and more uh, content aggregators and distributors in the digital space. So from companies like iTunes and MySpace and, uh, and Bebo to some of the smaller players and lots of digital startups. So we, um, you know, like you, I think digital is a space we're really getting into more and more and are learning as we go. So here's what, I, here's what I want to try and cover today. Um, first, that get everybody on message in terms of uh, doing your digital due diligence at the beginning of a film. So right at the very beginning of your production stage, um, making sure that you've got a, a focus on digital as well as your other forms of distribution. Second, once your film's made, um, figuring out how best to license that film at, and disseminate it across the platforms and make sure you get maximum penetration and, of course, maximum money. Um, and while digital is affecting distribution, it's also got some, got some innovative avenues when it comes to funding. And hopefully we can talk a bit about that and some of the ways that you can help raise money for your films. Okay. So to get through that, I'm hoping that fall takes up most of the time. Um, one, I'm going to whiz through. I'm going to talk about some of the issues you're going to come across in licensing agreements. Uh, talk about um, some of the models that you see in distribu digital distribution. Some of them are totally weird and in increasingly getting weirder. Um, and then talk about um, any questions that you have and hopefully get a discussion going. Okay. So here's the old perceived wisdom, if you like. And I'm sure you've seen this next quote before. Jack Valentine in his heyday. Um, what a sound prediction that was. So, and the same thing was said, of course, of DVD. So when DVD came out, there's a massive uproar, and people are very resistant to that new format. And in fact, it's you know, more, more powerful now than theatrical. OK. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this clip. It's absolutely terrible. Um, but I, I pull it up as, as an example of a few things. First, this was the most popular clip on YouTube for a long time, and it's some guy doing quite an inept dance to lots of different types of music. Um, but I think it's over 100 million views now. Uh, the issue for digital, um, and for the rights owners particularly, is that that content was never properly cleared. And so there's all sorts of different content within that clip that people aren't getting paid for. Now, the, the position of this clip is now number two, and number one is Avril Lavigne Girlfriend, which is slightly astonishing. But our, the record company that owns Avril Lavigne gets paid by YouTube. So I think, I, for me, this is a good case study of digital because A, there's a clip up there that people may not necessarily want to be up there, B, it's wildly successful, and C, it's not being monetized. And that's th that embodies, in one way, the threat of piracy that we're facing. And I'm going to talk about how we can try and combat that. OK. So hopefully, many of you will be familiar with the rights that you need to clear to make your film. And I'm going to talk about not all of these in detail, but I'm going to cover these uh, and talk about particularly how you need to deal with these kind of rights when it comes to preparing your film for digital. So, let's 
stop me if I'm going too fast here. Copyright subsists in the, in the following types of work. And to one extent or another, these, all these different copyrights have an effect on your film as you go through the production process. And if you own the copyright, here's what you can stop people doing. So copyright isn't a property right per se. It's the right to stop people doing something with your intellectual creation. So, no, that's a sure. Is this presentation going to be available? We can make it available, sure. Yeah, because it just guns how many Yeah, fine. We'll definitely make it available. Thank you. Um, so you can. The first thing you can do is stop people copying the work. Uh, probably the most important one. Second one is. There's this new right created in the law, early 2000s, to stop people communicating it to the public. Previously, the law said broadcast on uh, cable and satellite platforms, really antiquated. Amazingly, Europe got with the program and, and legislated for the internet and for mobile. So you can now stop people communicating your work to the public. And that's kind of divided up between push distribution. Hello. Um, push distribution and pull distribution. So broadcast and on demand, and we're going to talk a bit more about that. Really often I see people say you can distribute somebody's film on the internet, and technically that's not right, because the distribution right at law is um, for tangible copies only, and uh, that's a common mistake. Um, performance rights are the right to show the work in public, the right to adapt it. Sorry, hello. Sorry, sorry I, I, I missed the point that communication to public is restricted, but not on the internet. Communication to public, right? Sure. Property, but not on the sure. So, uh, the best way to describe this. So, there's this broad right of communication to public. I don't know if everyone can see that. And within there, you have the right of broadcast, and you have a right to make available. But the right of broadcast doesn't include the right um, to broadcast it on the internet. So you see, this is all about terminology, which sounds, which sounds overly technical until you get a license agreement where you give away more rights than you intend to, or you don't get rights that you think you've got. So um, broadcasting doesn't include broadcasting on the internet. There's no such thing. So we see lots of license agreements or distribution agreements that are, that are wrong. And that's fine when everybody's in agreement and people are making money, but it's, it always comes up when people start to fall out or people want to try and have their rights revert, and that's when it gets important. So you would put broadcast... You would, you would put... On the internet. No, you would put communicate to the public on the internet right. and not broadcast. Okay. Um, and then moving down here, the right to give your film for rental and lending. And here's the significance of that. So, as I said, it's the right to restrict acts of exploitation. If you don't clear all your contributions properly for digital distribution, you're going to limit your route to market, or in some cases you're going to prevent it altogether. I've seen a couple of films recently um, have really serious problems because the talent agreements weren't fully cleared and we had to go back and try and clear them and it's very hard to clear it when you've got a film ready to go and the talent knows this and obviously it gets expensive. So the more aware you are of this at an early stage reduces the risk for you but it also encourage, encourages innovative distribution because you've got full rights. Okay, so I'm going to try and whiz through this bit. So these are some of the questions exercising the mind of the music industry at the moment. If, if you're streaming, does that mean that there's a copy made? I would say no. However, lots of people say yes, and sometimes the law says yes in different territories. So for you, you need to figure out who needs to make a copy technologically in the distribution chain and give them the right to make that copy. Um, and then think about if people are copying without your permission, what rights do you have to try and stop them? Okay. And here's the point about broadcasting. So, it's not a transmission on the internet is not a broadcast unless it's a simulcast. I know this is fiendishly confusing, but bear with me. So, 
it's not a broadcast unless it takes place simultaneously on the internet. So simulcast, and that's to cover things that the BBC do and other big broadcasters. Or, or is a transmission of a live event. So a webcast falls under the broader communication to the public. Making available, so there's on-demand rights, and there's some brilliant commentary if you read some of the European Commission papers about you know, these European legislators trying to get their head around the concept of on-demand. And this is their neat way of saying on-demand, um, using five million words when they could have used two. The significance of that is, is prescriptive terminology in the agreements that you do. So if you say you're making something available, that means you're not giving the right to broadcast or simulcast it or, or transmit it to, as a, uh, a push stream. It's only on demand. Okay, Territoriality. This used to really be a big problem because you can never restrict the delivery of content by territory on the internet. Now... Um, porn industry is leading the way, I think, in directing content at people's postcodes. So those databases that ISPs hold that allow people to target content on the internet are now very sophisticated, they, they're fairly robust, and you can target by territory for the most part. Um, that being said, if I transmit my film to 10 European countries, which um, laws are relevant to that exploitation if somebody's infringing, and there's still conflicting laws about that. Can technology provide the, provide the answer? Certainly it can. But for you guys, wanting to make the most money from your films, there's a real economic incentive to license territorially. And that means, so far as you can, making sure that your distributor is on the hook for uh, limiting exploitation only to that territory. Okay. Moral rights, which I discovered the other day came from the Napoleonic Wars. So, moral rights is, a moral right is the right of somebody not to have their work denigrated, essentially, or, or made fun of, or attributed to somebody else. Um, the significance of this for you guys is that, that those rights were, used to be attributed only to authors, um, now also are given to performers. So when you're clearing your performers and drafting your performers' releases, you need to make sure you get a waiver of their moral rights so they can't complain if you edit the film or otherwise um, do something that they find offensive. Okay. Finally, database rights. I'm not going to go too much into this. Database rights are a right totally separate to copyright, only really relevant for the distributors but they're important for you as you distribute your film and try and build a fan base. So if you're, go, if you're, if you're pursuing guerrilla distribution or if you're involved in a, a community and you have a database of email contacts, um, has anybody seen um, The Whole Ten Yards? Or um, I forget what the first film was. There's some great, um, there's some great producers in... Um, Denver, who made a film and, and funded it entirely by uh, crowdsourcing on the internet and built an amazing database of contacts and I now get emails from them about their latest production and their new production is three times the budget of their first production and they've done really well. Is that the 10 mile There you go. They're, I forget the name, yeah. Uh, Hunter Weeks. That's right, Hunter and Josh. Yeah. So, so they've done really well at harnessing this power of the internet. They had a bit of an advantage. They both worked in marketing beforehand. But they um, have done really well at leveraging the power of the internet, getting, you know, getting their fans or people that are interested involved. And I, you know, they send me an email and I think, yeah, I, I quite like to look at your new film. And when I view it, I, they sold DVDs on a pay-what-you-think-it's-worth basis. And I think they did really well at that. So there's a value for you in building a database, and that has a, val uh, and that has a, a legal value as well as a commercial value. Okay. Here's some other things you want to think about. I don't, think, I don't want to go into these in too much detail. I'll talk about privacy in a minute because it's amusing. Trademarks, not that significant. Does anybody here use Creative Commons? Okay. Um, so... so so I think Creative Commons is generally a really good thing. Um, it allows for collaborative licensing. It simplifies copyright. Generally helps people to license their works on terms that people are, are, are understanding much easier than archaic copyright law. 
I do think, though, that it can be a good slave but a poor master. So you need to be really careful when using Creative Commons that you're picking the right license and that you really understand what the rights you're giving away are. Because it's sometimes very hard to claw those rights back once you've given them, and that's one of the pitfalls of Creative Commons. So have a look at the fre frequently asked questions and do read the long form licenses if you're going to use Creative Commons. Don't just look at the quick guide because they don't give you the full picture. There's an amusing aside for Creative Commons. Here is Alison Chang. Some of you may have seen this before. So here she is on the left. This is a picture she put up on her Flickr page, a family barbecue. Um, and she posted that under a commercial use license, a Creative Commons commercial use license, which means people can use that picture for commercial purposes without payment or attribution to her. And that's what Virgin did. Um, probably not as she would have liked. I, I like the little, uh, I don't know if you can see it from there, she says, hey, that's me, no joke. So, um, and interestingly, the community kind of rallied around her and she brought an action against um, Virgin in Texas and she won. But I think that's a really good example of how people can... But how, how, well, she didn't bring the claim under Creative Commons, she brought it for privacy. Oh, yeah. 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 So, Still be careful. Yeah, she brought the claim for privacy and she chose Texas as a jurisdiction because it was very favourable. But without that, she'd have had no recourse. Without telling that, I wouldn't, you know, it seems incongruous. No, fair enough. Would you stand a chance of bringing that kind of case over here? Uh, so, going back, the Naomi, Co the Naomi Campbell case sets a good precedent for data protection. So, um, it, it, it the, the, Naomi, the Naomi Campbell case established that a photograph can constitute personal data under the Data Protection Act. So maybe she'd have, but there's not, you know, we don't have the same privacy rights. They're really developing in this country compared to some other countries, compared to Texas. Okay. Fine. So that's the, that's the underlying law. That's the really dull bit on something really interesting. So, um, here, the, I use this as an example of some of the distribution. I mean, this is a really simplified version of some of the things we see coming from, that's right, coming from um, some of the contracts for digital distribution. And often producers look at this and they can't make head or tail of it. Neither can we, for the most part. So, um, so far as you can, try and get a really really good understanding of where your digital file goes from the point of upload. You're giving it to an aggregator, you're giving it to a distributor, you're giving it to anybody else. Understand where they're going to be sending it and how that distribution process is going to work. Because it's going to allow you to figure out who's going to make a copy. It's going to allow you to really control that distribution and make sure that your file doesn't end up on sites that you don't want it to. Okay. So these are the kind of tensions you see when you're distributing digitally. On the one hand, if you're the owner, um, you're going to want to give your rights non-exclusively. You're going to want to license to as many people as possible for a short period of time. You don't necessarily want them to do the distribution for you. You want to limit it to territories, perhaps, so you can make more money. And you really want to make sure that you're limiting what they can do. So if they've got the right to broadcast, they've only got the right to broadcast. They've got the right to make it available for download or stick it on a mobile. They've only got that right. Um, and, if, and you want some money, right? So in the best case, if you're a major studio, you're going to get a, a huge advance. You're going to get a royalty each time that film's viewed or downloaded. Um, and in a best case scenario, you'll get a share of the other revenues that that film generates on the site, so largely advertising revenue. Of course, your licensee is going to want it exclusively. There's a value in that for them. They're going to want it for as long as possible, so optimum is perpetual. They want the right to sub-license and assign it to who they want to. They want it worldwide. Um, and they'll also talk to you a bit about free and promotional and kind of blind you with science and say there's no value for you if there's just promotional use of your film. And I think the music industry cottoned on to that a while ago with MTV. And promotional use doesn't really fly in the music industry anymore, and I don't think it'll fly in the film industry either. Okay. 
So how do you figure out where, once you've made your film, you've raised your finance, you've gone through the torturous process of production, how do you decide how to distribute it on digital platforms? I think the first thing to do is figure out what kind of uses you want permitted. So separate out those rights, your download rights, your on-demand streaming rights, your VOD rental, your mobile rights, your clip rights, perhaps your promotional rights. Where, do, where are you going to put the trailer? How are you going to, do you want to control the, the, the dissemination of the trailer? How do you get an audience on YouTube? And really sit down and strategize that quite clearly because that will then inform the kind of contracts that you enter into. Specify the storage and delivery <coughs> media. That might seem a bit odd. Lots of people were caught out by the iPhone and, what it, and, and its capabilities. And people didn't realize that if they were licensing the internet, people can access the internet quite easily on their iPhone. And, and it means that you know, content can be available on a handheld device. And I think the trickiest part is, think, is thinking about whether you try and follow the traditional models. There's been a lot of fighting amongst distributors about whether a, a VOD rental has the same uh, commercial value as a, as a tangible rental, or whether it's a VOD right. And you know, the significance of that is that there's different money involved. So for you, you can totally set the business model um, for your films, um, or also go with those distributors that you think uh, best suit uh, your strategies. Another issue in distribution agreements is some of the terminology is hugely confusing. So my advice would be to try and marry up. If you look at these here, your copy is one of the rights um, restricted by copyright. Perform is one of the rights restricted by copyright. Distribute is. Some of these other rights, well, what are they? Are you giving people a right over your copyright? And if, and if you don't understand what they mean, definitely look them up because I've certainly assumed something means one thing and then looked it up and found it means something entirely different. If you're really not, if you're really not sure, reservation clauses can give you a big value. So when you're entering into agreements to distribute your film, include a clause like this and as you say, I'll make, the, I'll make this presentation available. So that, so that you can then say, look, I'm giving it to you for the internet, that doesn't include mobile platforms, it doesn't include you know, Virgin IPTV, it doesn't include BT Vision, and you can really carve it up quite carefully using reservation clauses. Here's another one that we see really often. So people license the internet when they mean the World Wide Web, and vice versa. So still, I still see that. Uh, people grant internet rights and then find their contents going much further. So. Here's the very boring um, language that we use when we are drafting documents or there and thereabouts. Um, but if you're licensing for the web, then say you're licensing for the web and don't say that you're licensing for the internet. Often you see the words before or hereafter invented. There's so many cases about whether that holds up in new technologies. You know, if I license it, we did a dispute for a very famous band a while back who had done a deal with their record label that was, I think, probably done in the pub, you know, at two in the morning, and uh, three pages, and it included that phrase. And the question was, did the label have the right to distribute their films on the internet? And if they did, um, how much would the band get paid? And so, as new technologies come along or new distribution platforms come along and it's very difficult to see where things are going in the next five, ten years, iTunes, iTunes apps is a really good example of something that's hugely successful that I don't think people really thought, you know, could really have anticipated. So be careful if you use that phrase because it's get, it may catch you out and if you're not sure then don't use it. Um, and I think the law's decided it is possible to have technology in the reasonable contemplation of the party. So you can really give away those rights and find that you're not getting paid properly. Did the band get paid? <coughs> uh, we sent lots of nasty letters and they did get paid. Okay. So, my favourite device. So here's the many different ways that you can get your content onto a mobile phone. Some of these technologies not so prevalent as, as others, but it, you know, if you look at 
particularly on the mobile broadcast side, they may not be particularly popular in the UK, but in some other territories they're really catching on. So be careful what you're licensing out for mobile and do your homework in relation to territories so that you get a good sense of, um, uh, of what technologies will be used and what you're really granting. Okay, TV. Think IPTV, yet to really catch on, but it's going to be massive. Um, and so if people are looking for internet rights, have a think about whether that includes IPTV. And if it, and if it does, then have a, have a very close look at the kind of revenue splits you're being offered. Okay. And these, I think, are the questions that you want to be asking, just to summarize that. So how do you know what's going to work for you? Have a think about your film, have a think about your audience. Is there a risk that, for example, if you license it to Facebook, yeah, will, it, will it be available on phones? Do you want it to be? Do you want to be more specific about the platform specification? Okay. DRM, I'm so over DRM, um, as is the music industry. So there's this massive fuss about DRM. And sure enough, people were just gave up on it because consumers don't want it. Um, and you need to take the risk. If you, pr if, you, if you produce a good value proposition for consumers, they'll pay for your content. And if you don't, then they'll get it for free. OK. And that's even more boring, so I'm just going to skip over that. OK. How are we doing for time? OK. So these are the trends that we're seeing with our clients across the board in, produ in production companies, 360 commissioning. Um, application of CPM payment provisions, so Babelgum is a service that will offer to pay you per click or essentially per view, but they're applying a CPM model, which is the same model that advertisers apply to advertisements. Um, uh, uh, video CPMs, video ad CPMs have been going um, up and down depending on the level of interactivity that those video ads are affording. But it's one to watch because if you can get a good CPM on your movie, you may as well, it may be um, as lucrative as other licensing models. Open media, I'm going to talk a bit more about that. Bebo's open media platform, and we were involved in launching that and helping them develop that. And um, it's been very successful. True device convergence, so I've got one of the old dull Blackberries, but the new one's very much a convergent device. Um, open APIs, do, do people know what APIs are? So, so API is, um, is an interface between one site and another, and Google runs an open API, the BBC has an open API, Last.fm runs an open API. And what they do is, APIs allow, allow other services to plug in and take some of the data that a site makes available for dissemination on other sites. So it's really Web 2.0. The significance of that is if you're licensing to a site that has an open API, you want to think about whether your content... Is that like when you can get Google Maps to on your own website? Correct. Correct. So, and you can, you, can take, you can take it further. There's a great clip of uh, Google Maps um, syncing with um, the bullet car chase, and you can see the car running around Google Maps, and they do that by accessing the API and, and then mashing that up with the video, with the video stream. And there's whole sites dedicated to this kind of geekery. So um, the, for you guys, the importance of APIs is if you're going to license a site with an open API, is your film going to go through that API? And if it is, you probably want to know about that. Rich media widgets, so widgets massively popular at the moment. So say this is a web page. You've got, um, you know, you can have three or four windows totally delivered by different people. And if you're licensing your content to a service that runs a widget, what you may not realize is that widget may be available on another service that you want to license. So if MySpace runs a widget and you want to run a deal with, I don't know, Bebo, but there's a MySpace widget on Bebo, well, it's kind of worthless for you. So have a think about that when you're pricing your distribution. Is Snag coming into trouble with that? Sorry, Snag, say again? Is Snag Films coming into problems? Who are Snag Films? They have a widget that allows you to pay 
feature documentaries. Yeah. On, you know, basically, at the other side. Um, and they're operating the widget? Yeah. The, the, they own IndieWire now. OK. You know, so if they've got the rights, then they can do that. And if you're going to give them the film, then you should probably, you know, it's the lesser of the contract, unfortunately. Maybe some, some producers are not too happy about that. If I was a producer, I'd be happy about that if I got paid. Yeah. If I didn't get paid, I wouldn't be happy. It's kind of like that supportive thing. I right. They're, they're interrupting, uh, if you put a feature on there, yeah. they're interrupting it every 15 minutes or so. Sounds great. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, or, but you can have it two ways. You can have like uh, up to a 20 minute section of your movie. Right. And then you've got a button to link it to your site where you can sell DVDs. So okay. it's, you know, it has its pluses maybe, but it's, it, it didn't launch too long ago. Really. So. so that service is, I mean, I haven't looked at it, so I don't know, but that sounds nice and innovative. So they're giving you a way, they're giving A, a consumer or, or, or a producer a choice about the way that they deliver the film giving you the opportunity to make some money, perhaps <coughs> arguably at the expense of consumer enjoyment. Yeah. Um, it's the widget side that, as a producer, I'd be more concerned about because it may limit your other distribution opportunities. And that's fine, provided you know that the, where the widget's going and where it's going to end up. It could be anywhere. Precisely. Thing. Precisely. <coughs> okay. So this is the Bebo Kate Modern uh, production that we were involved in. We advised... Um, Bebo on the launch of its open media platform. We also advised the Cape Modern production team um, on the Cape Modern production. So, creators of Lonely Girl 15 are the people that were commissioned by Bebo. Um, Bebo came across Lonely Girl, thought it was a great product, massive, massive on YouTube. Um, when they came and proposed this idea, they said, oh, it's going to be solely funded by brands. And I, I have to admit, I was fairly skeptical about that, particularly when I saw the budget. Um, in fact, they raised it really, really easily. Um, I think that that's more, I think it's a, a, a much more fashionable model now. And I don't think it's so easy to raise that money from brands. But I still think, you know, working with brands is not um, as frowned on as perhaps it used to be. Even artistically, I think the, um, the, the, the producers were given quite a free reign. Um, the best thing about it, of course, is that you can speak to the characters. So you can go, you know, they had a Bebo page, you can interface with them, and you really got the audience engaged. And when the audience were engaged, that meant the audience uh, was high, and that meant that there was more money. Um, and then, of course, the question is, does that mean that there are spin-offs? Does that mean that you can actually reverse the model and go, TV to uh, internet to TV, or do you start on mobile and, and push um, your production onto um, internet? And so we work with a, a big social network in Finland who have 100, 100 million users, and they, they launched a, um, a mobile social network, hugely successful, that they can then reverse onto internet. And, and for your production, if you're going to produce Mobisodes or going to start distributing Mobisodes, Often you can, you can use that format to create a bigger, uh, a bigger production online. What's the name of this session? Uh, Habbo Hotel. So I think, you know, people are much, it's a lot more, hello. I'm also heard that um, there's a lot of money to be made because Cape Modern is such a specific thing. It's a Correct. No, absolutely. Well, yeah, if you own the format, if you can create the format and spin it out, then you really, you know, that's definitely where the money is. Because you can even, I mean, it's much more business than creative, I guess, but you can even outsource the production or just license the format and take a royalty. And that's where the licensing is important. Precise. That's where you look at your contract. So did I clear all those rights properly? Did I make sure that I cleared the format or, or, or the idea from the very beginning so that I can do that? Because if you can't, and if you do happen to find you've got a really, a really successful product on your hands, nothing, trust me, nothing will be more frustrating than me telling you that you can't use it. Just on that 
point, actually, what, what exactly is the format? Because presumably it's a character-driven drama. So what do you what do you like? Do you license the actual character or the plot lines, or how do you create something that you can make stuff? It's not a quiz show that we've got like this. I use the characters and plot line. That's quite a traditional model, really. It's like a TV model, except that you're limiting it by using on the internet, right? I mean, everything from dating shows to game shows have been licensed around the world for years. If you create the brand and then you license the interpretation, is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. So, so I get, uh, just to summarise that question, it is how, how would you protect your format? And I think it, in other territories you have a recognised format, right? In the UK you don't. Um, although, as you say, there's a developed practice of licensing formats. I think there's been enough litigation about formats to establish that they are protected. What you can do is make sure that you keep what we call a format bible. So keep a create a brand, register a domain, create you know, very, detailed, uh, very detailed synopsis and have quite clear format identifiers, we call them, that, that would point to infringement. If someone else created, for example, if you take the Kate Modern example, I created a, a teen drama in five minute segments with a character who you know, was, uh, had a mystery feel and you know, all, put all those at all those elements together and I think you would have a better chance of enforcing your then rights. Then you have to basically trademark that form or copyright it for one of better words globally so that it's recognised in various territories. So for example, if one or zero is producing a series at the moment of shorts, yeah. we have to be very careful about how that's interpreted globally. Depends how much money you have, uh, to be honest. I mean, I could... I, I'm sure our firm would happily take the money to trademark, register a trademark. Well, like for example, the line date was a big global success, wasn't it? So was Top of the Fox, 26 countries at one point. They, there would have been some kind of mecha mechanism for them choosing which territories to yeah. copyright it. And anyone yes. outside of that could copy it, I guess. Depends on the national laws. Right. Um, I think our advice would be pick those territories where you, where you want to go to. And you know, get some advice. Say if you want the US, probably should register it. Copyright subsists automatically in the UK, provided it's original and passes all those kind of tests. But pick pick those territories where you think either there's a big risk, or you want to exploit. And then, getting the domain is increasingly important. So making sure that you before you start branding your format, make sure the domain's available. Trademarks are not so important, but you know they're expensive. Is the issue. If you've got the money, of course, get a trademark. But there are automatic copyrights in Europe as well as the UK? For the most part. For the most part. There's not a registration requirement like that. And, and in the US, there's not a registration requirement anymore. Although lots of people still do register their copyright with the Copyright Office. The reason for that is that it gives other people notice. So if, if anybody ever infringes and they say, oh, I didn't know about this, oh, well, all you've got to do is look at the register and there it is. Could you do that for a website? I, I run a content aggregator yeah. um, and I've got various domain names, um, although I only use one. Um, and yeah. I've got a trademark in the UK, but the US is potential for people to copy what the, what the aggregation model is. Potentially you could. I mean, you could register the, the, art, the artwork, if you like, and, and the content of the website, or at least you know, have a good go at that. Getting a US trademark would probably help. Um, US patents are a lot easier to get, and you can patent computer programs, whereas in Europe you can't. So there is some benefit to doing some. You know, if the US is a target market, certainly get some advice on it, because you know, it's, it, it's a lot more litigious, and people are a lot more happy to you know, be a bit sneaky in the US because it's easier. Okay. Okay. So here's some final hints and tips. Obviously ensure your rights are cleared. It sounds so basic, but still one of the most common things we come across is, you know, when we were, when we were acting for financiers and we're given, you know, a Bible of documents by production companies, I could, you know, I can almost guarantee there will be an issue with their chain of title. And that means your money just doesn't arrive. Uh, and if you're trying to include digital revenues, 
when you're selling the film into financiers, if you can't show that you've secured those contractually, then they're not going to give you your money. So that's, that's a really important thing. Be really cautious just on, on, on the point of the widget and, and on some other services. They're trying to build a business too, and sometimes they'll include what I call a warehousing clause or an aggressive holdback. So they'll say, if you give your film to us, we will um, pay you X money, share of advertising, whatever it is, and I want that exclusively. Or you can't put it on my competitors' websites. And I have a natural inclination to resist that. Because I think in digital, you know, it's for you to set the strategy. It's definitely for you to push back on people that are trying to build a business out of your content. Because there's a very strong argument that you can build that business yourself to, to an extent without the help of um, people that are trying to uh, warehouse your rights. If you're concerned about a licensee um, being naughty or, or, or putting your content where, they don't, where you don't want it to go, make, make your grant of rights conditional on their compliance. So you only grant them the license conditional upon their complying with other terms of the agreement. For example, paying you. Because if they don't... If, if they don't pay you, you can say they don't have a license and you don't have to go through this big effort of litigating. You just say, sorry, you're not paying me. Send you a letter, you don't have a license anymore. It's really, really effective. Um, set out some CPs for, sorry, conditions precedent for exploitation. So if they, you want them to do some due diligence or encourage your film or get their metadata reporting right or DRM wrapping or whatever it is that you want them to do, um, before they can go out and, uh, and push your film out, then include them in the contract. Uh, uh, similarly, include an approval mechanism that will allow you to um, have a right of approval over new platforms, new websites. Take the widget example. Here's a list of approved websites. If you want to add it to you know, these following websites, you're going to have to come back to me. They'll resist that, but I think it's really effective in controlling the distribution. DRM technology, if you really care, I would probably not. Um, if you are going to go the DRM route, make them responsible for the failure. You don't want them saying, oh, it's Windows' fault, not mine, or you know, I can't control Apple. Well, fine, I just want my film off there quickly. The other thing is, often with chain of title, we see people don't cover music rights properly. Music rights are, um, I could probably give a whole session on music rights. But the point there is if they're not cleared properly, it sometimes creates real issues with the residuals and how are people going to administer that music and it makes your film less attractive. So think about the music you're putting in the film, think about the rights you take to sync it, because often the sync licenses are really restricted and exclude internet. And you can get caught out in that and I've seen people have to redub films where the music rights are not properly dealt with and it's a disaster. Um. I mean, the, the site that I run is a music video site. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, what, what we do is take out some of the premium content yep. and the distribution um, agreements, and the client is generally the filmmaker because a lot of the music videos are made by unsigned bands. Right. So, right, okay. <laughs> people probably may never have heard of PRS even, but anyway. Um, <laughs> So what I do is I make an agreement with the filmmaker yeah. in which they are required to have got the rights cleared with the writers and the music and, and for sure. the um, master. Um, I mean, I don't know that that's necessarily fair because I suspect most of the people further down the, the line don't really understand what's going on there. There's not very much um, revenue coming in anyway, so it's yeah. quite benign at the moment. Um, but it strikes me as the best way to deal with it, the neatest way to deal with it. I would agree, except that if you speak to the MCPS PRS Alliance, they would say that the person who requires a license from them is going way back to when we go back to this question about restricted acts, forgive me bashing through this. So if you go through these, back to the question of restricted acts, we'll get there in the end. So who's the party doing the copying? They'd say it's you. 
and they'd certainly say that you're the person making them available to the public. Yeah. So they would, if, you, if, you, if you're not licensed by the Alliance, then they would probably want to, li want to license you. And so you would have, as the operator of the website, I would say, fairly difficult time arguing that you don't need a license from the Alliance. What, the MGPS? Yeah. Okay. Assuming that the repertoire that you're licensing is controlled by them, if the, if the yes. band members are not... They may well not be members. If they're not, I think you just keep your obligation on whoever's supplying you the, um, the films to clear the rights. But it's tricky. The Alliance will almost certainly, you know, if you get on their radar, they'll come after you because they're yeah. greedy. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. they're not greedy. Mm -hmm. They want to pay their members, yeah. which I think is fair enough. Maybe I'll put a clause in there that if you are MTPS members, um, they, do want to, um, they need to flag that up and then I can then separately. I would do that. Licenses. I would do that. We certainly do. Okay. Anything about theatrical? I mean, is I know because that's eventually going to happen when more visual screens. Um, you know. Are, yeah. yeah. Is there any license already established for that? Or so we, we're involved in doing digital cinema rollout or digital s cinema system rollout in various territories. France is quite an, an advanced territory for digital cinema. Um, there's a whole, uh, there's a huge investment in infrastructure. Question whether that's being leveraged fully in terms of the way that you can use that technology to be innovative in cinema screens. Um, Certainly the delivery is much slicker, quicker, more effective. I think for, you, for a producer, the significance is you're going to be faced with a successful film with a whole slew of metadata requirements for your file. So you're going to create a digital file and for the, for the digital cinema people to be able to report to you properly, or they're going to need metadata in that file. And the question is who is responsible for encoding that file because it's expensive and who is going to be responsible for reporting back to you and making sure that you get paid. And so if you're going to go with a digital cinema distributor, make sure that their metadata practices and their digital hygiene is good. You know, technical error, uh, you know, really step, you know, really raising the bar on this and investing a lot of money into digital systems. And I would, if I were you, I'd be inclined to go with somebody who you know, really knows their stuff, because if they don't, you're never going to get any money, because they won't be able to report to you, because they won't know what you're talking about when you say, you know, what metadata fields do you want? Limited split of expertise, but um, there's a lot of talk yesterday about raising money for online communities for production. Uh, we did the same for a project which I put together. Yeah. It was mentioned almost in passing yesterday that in the US you weren't, they weren't able to um, allocate rights to a film online, so if you, if you wanted people to invest in your film, you couldn't do that in a way that would give them any kind of profit share in the US. I've never heard that before. I wonder if that was true of a UK company setting up to require um, attract investment through an online community, but to allow people to have a sharing of the film, to have any restrictions on that. If you, hmm, so there's two, there's two elements to that. I think the first one is, if you, if you are, um, only going to finance the film through those people that are investing online. Um, you've got 100 people investing, you can split that share 100 ways. You don't have any other financier involved, so you don't have to worry about who has first rights of payment. I don't see a problem with that. What I do see a problem with is whether you're complying with FSA and investment finance rules. So often people kind of go ahead you know, come and give some money for my film, and they'll fall way below the radar, but you're, you're essentially offering an investment. And are you complying with all that massive bulk of financial services legislation that requires, when you're offering something for an investment, to have a full list of disclosures and give potential investors a, a, a proper rundown of the risks of that investment? And those documents go for pages and pages. Well, that's exactly So you have to wait and say, register the top of that, which is just 
So, so, so I'm not a, a financial services lawyer, thank God. But um, I've seen, I had one client very recently who raised an EIS share offer. I don't know. I mean, that was fairly neat and tidy and in terms of fees. You know, you're going to, unfortunately, you're going to be budgeting 10, 20 grand on lawyers for that, even if you get a really cheap one. So I'm being... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry. We're, we're in this right on time, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.